and an encouragement to you. So let me just invite you uh, to join us for that midweek uh, time of Bible study together. I also want to encourage you, I I don't uh, mention this on Sunday mornings, but just on the back of the bulletin, there is our prayer list, uh, various prayer needs. If there's ever an update to these prayer needs that you might have, be sure to contact us here at the church office so that we can update that as well. Well, thank you for being with us once again. I do want to thank uh, Sandy, Todd, and Lisa Adams for going with us yesterday, uh, young people down to Samaritan's Purse, and we packed some shoe boxes, had lots of fun doing that. And uh, the shoe boxes we packed yesterday, we put something on our uh, student Instagram page about it. All the shoe boxes we packed yesterday, uh, they were specifically going to closed countries, so countries where the gospel can't get in. Uh, these were specific for that, and I forget what the number was we did. It was 19,000. It was over 19,000 shoeboxes uh, that we did, so uh, praise the Lord for that, and thank you, Sandy, and thank you, Lisa, for your help in that. Well, Pat's coming this morning to lead us in worship. Thank you, Josh. I'm going to be using the hymn books this morning. If you'd like to get one, 215, 216, and 217, a trio of songs. Let's stand, please, as we sing. All right, sing it right out now. Majesty, worship His majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom of God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of His name. Jesus, the name that calms my fears, that bids my sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinners ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, his blood availed for me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh. 
Thank you. Be seated. Great singing. Appreciate it so very much. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer here this morning. Father in heaven, we are grateful to you for this day that you have given to us another opportunity to come together and to worship you and to sing praises to you and to hear your word. Father God, we ask that your will will be done in this place. Lord, wherever individuals are at as they enter into this building or, or join us online, and their walk with you. I pray, Father, that today you would do a work in hearts and lives. I pray, Father, if there is one or more here this morning who does not know Christ as their Savior, that today would be the day that they would repent of their sins and trust in Christ as Savior and Lord. Father, for Christians this morning who are cold or wayward or indifferent towards you, I pray, Father, today that you would work in such a way that you would draw them back to yourself, that you would revive hearts, that we as a people would be serious about our Father's business. Lord God, for those that are suffering this morning, who are grieving the loss of loved ones, who are dealing with afflictions and difficulties, would you minister to them? Would you give comfort and encouragement. Here this morning, no doubt, there are individuals who are joining us for worship whose hearts are weighed down just by life. And I pray that today they would be encouraged and strengthened and uplifted as they turn their eyes to you. And so, Lord God, we lay this time before you. We ask you to be honored and glorified in everything that is said and done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As part of our music this morning, I've asked Pastor Steve to come and sing with me a duet entitled, Are You Washed in the Blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed, Are you washed in the blood? In the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are they washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you walking spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood? In the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And if you are washed in the blood, aren't you glad this morning? 
If you would, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke. And this morning we're going to be in chapter 12, verses 22 through 34. Luke 12, 22 through 34. So there was a, a man who was working on top of a, a building, and he slipped and he fell 110 feet to the ground. When he landed on the ground, there was a pile of rocks there that he missed by about three feet, and he landed in a soft pile of dirt face down. And when the paramedics arrived, they called 911. When the paramedics arrived, they rolled him over. He was a little bit bruised and battered, but he got up, he was walking, and his back was a little sore, but God had protected him from a 110-foot fall and kept him safe. And when the paramedics were carrying him on a stretcher over to the ambulance, he looked up at them and he said, don't drop me. (laughs) That's kind of typical of how we do life, isn't it? We tend to kind of worry about a little bit of everything, fret over life on a daily basis. We tend to have fears about what's going to happen to me next, what's going to happen to tomorrow, what's my future going to be years from now or even this week. And these things can weigh us down. They can kind of get on uh, under our skin. They can kind of sometimes even keep us from sleeping at night. As we talked about recently, David tossing and turning and, and having these things go on in his mind. Maybe that's you. Maybe you have been what you would call a worrier, a fretter, somebody who worries about stuff all the time. And maybe it just bogs your life down. Maybe it's keeping you from enjoying each day, from enjoying your family, from enjoying your job, uh, from just enjoying life in general. As we dig into this passage this morning, let's keep those things in mind for your own life. As we dig into this, let's read together. If you're able to stand, Luke chapter 12. We're going to read verses 22 through 28, but later we'll cover most of the verses here in this section. We're reminded all scriptures inspired by God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And thus we read from the word of God. Then he said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass which, is today, is, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? Oh, you have little faith. You can be seated. The main idea I want you to take away from our passage this morning is simply this. As believers, you need not fear your future. Let me say that again. As believers, you need not fear your future. There are three specific truths that I want us to consider this morning. Three things that we can look at that I think will help us to avoid fear of the future. The first is simply this, trust that God will care for your needs. Trust that God will take care of, excuse me, will take care of your needs. So as we look into this passage this morning, Jesus is speaking here and he's talking to his disciples. He begins verse 22 by saying the word therefore. And when we're studying the Bible and we see the word therefore, we are to ask, what is it therefore? Okay, so it points us back. I know we didn't look at this passage uh, last week or anything, but if if you kind of go back and look at the passage before, 
He's talking about uh, the parable of the rich fool. He's talking about beware of covetousness in verse 15. And he ends that section in verse 21 by saying, So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So the context is somebody is coveting, storing up things for themselves and not for God. That's the context. And so verse 22 says, Therefore, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Now the logical thing that the disciples might be thinking here is, is well, okay, if God said, hey, don't store up things for your, yourself, but, let, uh, but store up things toward God, then who's going to take care of our basic needs? How are we going to feed ourselves? The disciples especially may have been thinking this because they're walking with Jesus. They've left everything and are out on the road with Him, basically. So they may have been thinking that. So Jesus says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. It's an interesting word, worry, in the original Greek language. It literally means to be torn apart, split apart, or pulled in different directions. And isn't that exactly what our mind does when we worry? Our mind gets pulled to this direction and this direction, toward this thing that might happen and this thing that might happen. We begin to go through all the what-ifs in life. Has anybody, especially over the last year and a half, asked any, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? In relationship to the virus, in relationship to the police, things like that. In relationship to what if there's no gas tomorrow? I mean, that one hit recently. We, we spend all our times worrying about the what ifs. I'm going to tell you something. There were a lot of people who were worrying because they were at the pumps lined up for miles in places, right? So worry. It's to be pulled in all these different directions. And so the Bible says, Jesus said, don't worry. This is a, this is a present imperative in the Greek. And so what that is, is it, it means that we should not continue in this action of worry. We should not be in the state of worry. That's what God is saying to us there. And it's an imperative. So it's saying, don't do it. And literally, because the disciples were probably worried about this, He was probably also saying, stop doing that. And, and so I would say to us this morning, the message might be, don't do this, but the message might also be, stop doing that. Stop worrying. Jesus says. And then he says specifically, stop worrying about your life. What you will eat. Uh, life is, here he ties it to our nourishment. If we don't eat, we're going to what? We're going to die. So he says, don't worry about your life. Your life is summed up basically in this. You need to eat in order to live. But God says, don't worry about that. Don't be pulled in all kinds of directions over food. Boy, we can get caught up in that one, can't we? And we've got plenty to eat, most of us. And I won't, I mean, all you gotta do is look up here and see I've got plenty to eat. We've all got plenty to eat. We worry about, we even worry about what restaurant to go to and sit in the car and, and debate it for 10 minutes about where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to go? And we're debating food and we worry over the restaurant we're going to go to. We get to the restaurant, we worry over the menu. Some of you, I'm not saying who, I don't know who, but some of you sit and look at the menu and everybody else has ordered and you're still looking at the menu trying to figure it out. Am I right? So we worry about our food. We worry about how we're going to put food on the table. He goes on to say, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body and what you will put on. Now, we do that too, don't we? We worry about our clothes. I was worried about my clothes because I was walking over here this morning uh, carrying a coffee cup in one hand, a sermon by Bible in, in one hand. I had my coat draped over my arm and I got to the door of the church and got to the office door and it was locked and I was trying to reach in my pocket, pull out my keys, put it in the door while holding all that and spilt coffee all down the coat. And then that worried me that you were going to see that I had coffee all down my coat. And I was in there scrubbing my coat, trying to get it off. I'm worrying over that. How many of us worry over what we're going to wear today? Worry and go through and look through a closet full of clothes and try to figure out, do I want to wear this color today, this outfit today, this shirt today, this hat today? What do I want to wear today? We worry about all kinds of things over and over again. God says, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, nor your body, what you will put on. And then listen to what He says. Life 
is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Now let that soak in for just a minute. A lot of times we treat food as if that, that's what life's all about. Where are we going to eat? What are we going to eat? A lot of times we treat our body and the, and the clothes that we put on like the body's all about what kind of outfit I've got on today. And God says, don't worry about that. Life is more than food and your body is more than clothing. Now he's talking about life is more about what's spiritual. And even our body is more about what's spiritual. Our body should be given as a, as a living sacrifice to God. We should be more worried about what we're doing with our bodies before God than what we put on our bodies out of the closet each day. And so the Word of God just says don't worry about those things. And then Jesus, I don't need to illustrate this this morning because Jesus illustrates it for us. Look what He says in verse 24. Consider the ravens. Now the ravens, this is not the Baltimore ravens, but the ravens were the worst of the worst birds. Okay, The ravens were birds that people did not like. They despised them. He says, consider the ravens. They don't sow nor reap. They don't have storehouses or barns. They can't store up food in a storehouse or a barn like a man can. And God feeds them of how much more value, and don't miss this, of how much more value are you than the birds? Listen, human beings are more valuable to God than any creation. We are made in His image. We are more valuable than the animals, more valuable than the insects, more valuable than anything on this earth. God has made us very special. Don't let anybody tell you that you are not valuable. You are valuable to God. He goes on to say, in verse 27, a second example about our bodies. Consider the lilies. Now, th this is literally any flowering plant in that day. Consider the flowering plants, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. They don't do any work. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And then he appeals to our heart again and he says, If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown in the oven. Grass in that day oftentimes was thrown into the oven and burned and, and used for cooking purposes. He says, if, if you, how much more valuable or how much more will He clothe you? And then he says this, Oh, you have little faith. What does worry ultimately come down to? A lack of what? A lack of faith. Thus, I said at the beginning, trust that God will take care of your needs. Trust God to take care of your needs. So he goes on to say in verse 29, and do not seek. All right, so first he says, don't worry about those things. Now he shifts gears and he said, and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. Now, in, in our English language, we might think the word worry and the word anxious were identical. They're two different words in the Greek. And so I mentioned er earlier that worry was to be torn apart, to, to be pulled in multiple directions. The word anxious here is where we get our word meteor from. And it literally means something that was up in the air, something that was held in suspense. Okay? Is your mind ever held in suspense? Have you ever watched a movie where they held you in suspense the whole time? I, I like TV shows where they hold you in suspense and you don't know who did it until the end. Uh, like the old Columbo show back in the day. The kids are Googling that right now. So I, I like suspense shows that hold you in suspense. You know what worry does? You know what anxiousness is? It's being held in suspense. Your mind is always held in suspense wondering about this or that. What's this going to do? What's that going to do? What's going to happen at work tomorrow? What's going to happen at school tomorrow? What's going to happen with my spouse tomorrow? What's going to happen with this tomorrow? And your mind is always up in the air held in suspense. That's anxiousness. So God says in verse 29, Don't seek what you should eat or what you should drink nor have an anxious mind. And then listen to this. He says, for all these things, what things? What you eat, and what you drink. The things that cause you an anxious mind about that. For all these things, the nations of the world seek after. 
And your Father knows that you need these things. So he, he says, look, the rest of the world, the unbelievers, those that don't know Christ, they're all seeking and storing up all this food and all this clothing and all these things, worrying about what their life is and worrying about what they're going to eat and what they're going to clothe themselves with. They do that. That's not what you do. God knows you need these things. He knows that you need food to eat. He knows that you need clothes on your bodies. So instead, he says in verse 31, instead of seeking after those things like the rest of the world does, instead, here's what you're to do, verse 31, but seek the kingdom of God. Seek the kingdom of God. And then what happens when you seek the kingdom of God? What happens? All these things are added to you. All what things? Your needs of eating and being clothed. Notice I said needs and not wants. There's a big difference there. Needs and not wants. God does not promise to fill your closet full of 150 outfits. God does not promise to put 20 different dishes on your plate every night or on your table every night. God doesn't promise you that the menu will have steak, baked potato, salad with a with a uh, this is what I ate Friday night. A steak, baked potato, salad, and an and a appetizer of shrimp cocktail. He doesn't promise you that. But He promises to take care of your needs. And that's what He says here. So what do we do? We don't seek after those things. We passionately seek after the kingdom of God. And then all those things will be added to us. Now let me ask you this question. Does that mean that we shouldn't work? That we should just trust God? Not do anything? I'm just going to retire, relax, do nothing. And watch God take care of me. You have to interpret Scripture with what? With Scripture. Okay, this is a rule of interpretation of the Bible. Too many people don't interpret Scripture with Scripture and they'll take a verse out of context and prove their point and often wrongly because they've not looked at all of Scripture and what it says. We interpret Scripture with Scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. For even when we were, without, we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he what? So God doesn't say don't work. God says work. All right? And He'll take care of your needs. So trust Him to care for your needs. Seek the kingdom, not your food. Seek the kingdom, not your clothing. Seek the kingdom, not your wants. And your needs will be met by God. You can trust that. Go back over to Luke chapter 12 again. There's a second statement I want you to see, and that is this. Worry can't change anything. Worry won't change anything. Boy, Pastor, how long did it take you to come up with that one? We all know it. And there's not a person in this room, I'll bet you right now, not a person in this room that would not agree with that statement. But, but, but don't we act like worry changes things? But worry doesn't change anything. So, a minute ago, I skipped these two verses wanted to go back. So look back at verse 25. And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Now, a cubit is about 18 inches long. And on the average man, it's the distance from your elbow to the tip of your finger. Okay, that's... In fact, mine is exactly 18 inches. Alright? So, that's a cubit. Your stature is your height. There are some scholars, and obviously the interpretation here in the New King James Version, the, the translation, is are, are these words. Who can change your stature by adding a cubit to it? All right? Well, certainly, I can't change my height. 
Uh, I wanted to change it. When I was in the eighth grade and I grew from 5'2 to 5'11 in the eighth grade and played center and power forward on the basketball team at Brown Junior High School and thought, man, and my mom's brother was 6'6, my daddy was 6'3, and I'm like, I'm going to be tall and I'm going to play center in basketball, and I never grew but a half inch the rest of the way. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't change anything about it. No point in worrying about it. I couldn't fix it. I couldn't change it. Now, some scholars point out that the words translated cubit and stature can also here refer to um, a time frame or a span of time. And so some interpret this that no matter what you do, you can't change, you can't add one day to your lifespan. And that's certainly true too. So either way, the point is this. No matter how much you worry, it won't do what? It won't change anything. It won't change anything. Now, my wife, bless her heart, absolutely loves a rocking chair. And, and I like a rocking chair pretty good. Go to a cabin in the mountains. I like to sit and rock a little bit, you know. But she loves a rocking chair. You know, worry is like a rocking chair, though. You can rock all day and you don't go anywhere. It won't take you anywhere. You can worry all day and it won't take you anywhere. It won't do anything for you. It won't change a thing. Listen to this. The average people, this is, this is just some statistics. These are some statistics. 40% of what people worry about never happens. Now think about that for a minute. 40%, almost half of what we worry about never happens. We're worried about tomorrow and this happening or that happening and it never happens. 40%. 30% of what people worry about are things from the past. Can you change your past? No. We worry over our past. We worry about what we did yesterday. We worry about what we did last week. We worry sometimes about things we did 35 years ago. 30%. 12% worry about needless health issues. 10% worry about just miscellaneous little petty things. You ever worry about little petty things that don't matter anyway at all? Come on, be honest, do you? Only 8% of what we worry about are legitimate things that are serious things that actually happen. And here's the reality for that 8%. You and I couldn't change that by worrying either. So why worry? I love this quote from Corey Ten Boom. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Let me say that again. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. What a great quote. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. What should we do rather than worrying? Cast all your care where? Upon Him. Why? Because He cares for you. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. Philippians four nineteen. Listen to what it says. And my God shall supply how many of your needs? All your needs. According to your riches. Is that what it says? According to His riches in glory. Thank God He doesn't supply it according to what I have, but according to what He has. God will take care of your needs. Why worry? Worry changes nothing. Go back to Luke chapter 12 again, and there's a third statement I want you to consider, and that is this. God gives you His kingdom. God gives you His kingdom. So in verse 31, we said it a minute ago, He said, but instead, here's what you do. Seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Well, somebody might be thinking, well, God, Pastor, you know what? If I seek the kingdom of God, how do I know I'm ever going to find it? Well, the Bible says this, Seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Verse 32, Do not fear, little flock. Can you hear the compassion of Jesus in the phrase, little flock? My little flock. Don't fear. 
Here's why we need not fear. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you what? To give you the kingdom. To give you the kingdom. It's His pleasure to do that. He wants to do that. So, God gives you His kingdom. You say, well, what is it to seek after the kingdom of God? I love the words of Chuck Swindoll who said it this way. He said, put your energy, your time, your money, your earthly resources into God's kingdom is God, into God's kingdom enterprise and He will adorn you, feed you, and eventually give you access to all that is His. I like the way he said and eventually give you access to all that is His because when He gives you the kingdom, there's a whole bunch that goes with that now in this life and then there's a whole bunch of it that comes later in life, later after we die. But either way, God gives you the kingdom. He gives you the kingdom. Now what do you, how do we think about that? Sorry, the wind keeps blowing the pages up here. How do we think about that? I want you to think about this first. It all starts in your heart. Okay? The Bible talks about giving you a new heart. The Bible talks about your inner man being changed upon salvation. The moment that you or I trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, the Bible says that we were changed. We became a new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, all things became new. But when you confess Him as Savior and Lord, when you confess Jesus as Lord, listen, He then becomes the Lord of your life. And the Bible says that the kingdom of God is now. God reigns in you if you have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. He rules in you. Jesus is your King now. He has set up rule and reign in your inner man. He is reigning in your life right now. Sin used to master your life, and now Jesus masters your life. So the moment you trusted Christ, the kingdom of God began to rule in you here and now. Not only that, you became a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and your citizenship is in heaven. And you're living based on heavenly things right now. So it starts in your life. The kingdom of God is a gift to you set up in your life the moment you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And I want you to think about this. You can have everything in the world, but without the kingdom, you are broke. Everything in the world, but without the kingdom, we are broke. But God gives us the kingdom. So, how does this work? God will set up His reign in your life now. His kingdom is in you now. And then here's a promise from God. One day, King Jesus is going to come back. And the Bible says that He is going to set up a thousand year reign on this earth in perfect peace. And there is going to be a, year, a, a thousand year, I believe, literal thousand years where Jesus is going to rule and reign on the earth and there's going to be peace on the earth. There's not going to be any political turmoil. There's not going to be any war. There's not going to be any of that. Jesus reigning for a thousand years and you and I get to participate in it. That's promised us one day. But after that, after that thousand years is over, and during that thousand years, Satan is, is according to the Bible, he is bound in, during that thousand years. And he can't roam, and he can't deceive, and he can't do anything with you at all because he's bound. And at the end of that thousand years, he's going to be let out one last time for one last battle, if you want to call it that, because it's going to be over just like that. And King Jesus is going to destroy Satan, destroy the false prophet, destroy the beast, and all evil will be cast into the eternal lake of fire. And then for the rest of all eternity... The kingdom of God will be what you and I are a part of in a perfect heaven and a perfect earth. 
All of this is for us to look forward to one day. Pastor, that's great. I'm excited about that. I'm looking forward to that. But I struggle every day with worry and fret and fears about my future and what's going to happen. I want you to think about this. You not only get the kingdom of God set up in you with Him reigning in your life. You not only get a promise of a thousand year reign with Jesus ruling on a perfect earth. You not only get Jesus coming back to take you to heaven and live forever on a perfect earth and perfect heaven with no more death and pain and sorrow and sin. You not only get all of that, but you get everything that He has now in your life. Every resource is yours The Bible says that we are blessed right now with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You have all the spiritual blessings of God already given to you. You have been blessed with the Holy Spirit to live inside of you and to empower you to live the Christian life and to do the work that God has called you to do. You are blessed right now with His power. You are blessed right now with His strength. When you are weak, He is what? Strong. You are blessed right now with His wisdom when you need it. You're blessed with His peace that passes all understanding when you are anxious and go to the throne. You're blessed with His presence when you feel all alone. You're blessed with His protection and His provision. You're blessed with all of that now in Jesus Christ. So why worry and fret and be fearful? over the future. Look at all that we have in Jesus if the kingdom is truly yours. Will you pray with me? With every head bowed, every eye closed, in a moment of just silent reflection, I want you to think about what we just talked about and what the Word of God said to you. Are you worrying? Are you being pulled in multiple directions? Anxious? Your life's always in suspense of what if this, what if that? Constantly worrying and it's robbing you of the joy of today. It's robbing you of the strength of today because you're worrying about tomorrow. Now's the time to turn that over to God. The Bible says be anxious for nothing But in everything, in supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the promise is this, that the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Cast your cares upon Him. He cares for you. He'll take care of your needs. You seek the kingdom and leave the rest up to Him. Work hard. For the glory of God, but leave the rest up to Him. So take your worries and your anxiousness and just cast it all on Him right now. Whatever it is. A health issue, cast it on Him. A finance issue, cast it on Him. A relationship issue. Something from your past that you just worry about all the time. Cast it on Him right now. Whatever it is, you know, let the Holy Spirit right now show it to you. And then cast it on Him. And let the peace that passes all understanding guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Let Him take that worry away. Let Him strengthen you so that you won't worry again tomorrow. And every time the devil brings that worry back over, you just cast it right back to Jesus. Every day. Every moment. Do that. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, whether you're watching online or in the room today, today is the day of salvation. If you're in the room, here's what I want you to do. Pastor Josh and I will be standing down front in just a moment as we sing. I want you to come down. I want you to come down and tell one of us that I want to pray to receive Christ or I have a question about trusting Christ. Come talk to us today. If you're watching online, reach out to us tomorrow or this week. Call the church office Come see us. Talk to us about trusting Christ as Savior and Lord. You can trust Him right where you are right now. Just call on Him and say, Lord Jesus, save me from my sins and give me eternal life. Be my Lord. And He'll do that. But then reach out to us and let us talk you through what's next. 
Maybe God is calling you to join our church today. You come and let us know that, and we'll walk you through what that process looks like. Maybe you just need somebody to pray for you. Reach out to us and let us pray. Father, move in the hearts of all of your, your people today in the room and watching online or even those that will watch later. And do your work, oh God. Help us to do our part and trust you with rest. Lord, help us right now to cast all our cares on you. Thank you for the promise that you'll give us peace. Thank you for all the promises of the spiritual blessings that we have with your kingdom. And thank you, God, that we get to spend eternity with you in a perfect place with Jesus as our King and Lord. We thank you for all these promises. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Right now, as God is leading you, you come and speak with one of us. 294 in your hymn books. Let's stand, please, as we sing. 294, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting yielded and still have thine own way Lord have thine own way search me and try me master today whiter than snow Lord wash me just now as in thy presence humbly I bow have thine own way Lord have thine own way head to the back of the church to greet any guests that are leaving, but we do have a short church conference uh, to uh, cover some financial stuff, so um, if you're a member of the church, please stay and be a part of that, and guests, thank you so much for being here today, and again, I look forward to speaking to you at the back. In